All right, I feel, I feel a little bit self-conscious about something, so I better talk about it and get it out of the way. I, I, I have an abscess, so if you see my face slightly swollen on this side, you know what it is. So, it's, 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 it's much better now. Um, but it still is a little swollen and, and it's irritating when I look in the mirror. So, um, <laughs> I just want you to know so, so then I can feel relaxed knowing that nobody's saying, what's wrong with his face? <laughs> All right. Now, this, this evening, I'm going to, I'm going to entitle my, my thoughts, Understanding Sin Intelligently. Okay? I, I'm using a word there that it seems some people don't like. All right, I'm using the word intelligently. There are, there are some people, strangely enough, who believe that when you are dealing with spiritual things, you are to be like some kind of mindless sponge. You are supposed to just read and not think. You know, some people have that strange idea. When you start trying to go be beneath the surface and understand what you are studying, they become uncomfortable and they accuse you of using human reasoning. But I, I know that this kind of attitude is typical of people who have locked their minds against truth. I mean, Jesus was never like that. Jesus, the, the, the Pharisees, the Jews came and they said, why do your disciples eat without washing their hands? For them it was not a question of what is intelligent and reasonable and sensible. It was a, it was a question of what does the rule say? That is what determined how they viewed life and how they related to religion. What does the rule say? Why are your disciples picking corn on the Sabbath day? They knew the rule, but they didn't understand what they were dealing with. And this kind of what I call mindless religion, I mean, it's hard for me as a... a, a well, well, some people say that, that my... I don't want to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience, but I don't want to focus on myself. But, you know, people say that my, my words are sometimes harsh, sharp, or extreme. And sometimes, maybe sometimes that is true, but I don't intend to because I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to hit at people. But I'm, I'm forceful in the way I say things because I feel strongly, okay? It's my characteristic that I feel strongly about the things I believe. If I, didn't, if I didn't feel strongly about them, I would not be promoting them. I'd not be traveling around trying, to, trying to, to tell people the things I believe if I didn't feel strongly about them. In fact, when I stand up here to preach, it is my intention to change your thinking. I want your thinking to change. That's why I'm here. That's my, my purpose. If you want to hear the same kinds of things, don't listen to me. If you want to hear... The same thing regurgitated over and over. You don't need to listen to me because you, you can just go and read the same books or listen to the same tapes or whatever. But I speak strongly because I, if the Lord blesses me with something that benefits my life, my purpose is to help you to be benefited in the same way. And I want to share it and I want to share it in such a way that you don't mistake what I'm saying that you understand exactly what I'm saying and that you are able to appreciate it as I have learned to appreciate it. That's my, that's my job here, okay? My job here is to share what the Lord has shared with me. And sometimes I'm forceful and um, it's interesting. <laughs> Brother Willie was saying, his, his father said, you say I look stern, that man looks stern. <laughs> Referring to me and it made me do a double take. I, am I really... I guess my face is, is a bit, but I, I don't mean any harm. I don't mean any harm. I'm just, 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 just um, forceful in what I'm saying because for me it's important and I, I, I want to share it. So, but, but on this subject, I, um, I, um, I feel it a lot because as most of you know, whenever you stand in a public place, 
regardless of whether it's just a small position like I stand in sometimes. People criticize you. And I'm sensitive. I try to ignore it, but I'm sensitive to it. I'm sensitive to the fact that people say, you're using human reasoning, even though you base everything on the Bible. Now, so I'm just, I'm just defending my statement or my topic this evening, understanding sin intelligently. If you don't want your religion to be intelligent, that's, that's another thing. You, you can excuse yourself from my meetings because my aim is to... I'm not saying I'm, I'm intelligent more than anybody else, but I'm, I'm seeking to have an understanding and not just to hear words is what I'm trying to say. Now, 13 years ago, I was, I was like most of the people who are called historic Adventists. 13 years ago. The difference was that I believed in the one true God. 13 years ago, that's where I was. I believed in the one true God. But in every other respect, I was, I was a, a normal historic Adventist. And for those who don't understand, that's people like um, John Grosbull and Ron Spear and um, Vance Ferrell and a lot of people who are presently in what we call the one true God movement. And if you are, if you are a total neophyte, you are new to this, there is, there is an independent movement within Adventism where people have come to understand that God is not a trinity. And in this movement, this, that most people are, commonly, are bound together by the common tie that they believe God is not a trinity. And so it's a kind of movement. But most of these people in, are in every other respect simply Seventh-day Adventists, except that they don't believe in the trinity. And, and unfortunately for many people, when they come to this place, they believe that they have arrived at the end of truth. If you ask me, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of talking out of my heart this evening, okay? One of the things that grieves me, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not mincing words, it grieves me, is the closed-mindedness. The closed-mindedness. People are locked in a box and they have no desire to get out of it. For them, the question is not, what is true? The question is, where, where does this fit into my box? Do you know that's exactly why the Jews crucified the Son of God? Do you know that's why they killed him? It was because <clears throat> they knew that their system was the truth and that there was no other truth. And everything that came had to fit into that box. Jesus came and he preached from the same scriptures. But he said things that they had never heard in their lives. It blew their minds and they were not willing to accept it. Because the implications were too great. If they accepted what he said, their entire system would crumble. And so they found a solution and the solution was to kill him. That spirit is alive and well today. And so 13 years ago, I... I was in my kitchen one morning about five o'clock. I was in my kitchen sitting in a corner and I was praying. And I was really feeling depressed because I had been a Christian at that time for 30 years. 30 years. No, yeah, 30. 32 years. And my desire, like, like everybody else, was that I wanted to be perfect. From, from the moment I became a Christian, I wanted to be another Enoch, another Elijah, another Moses. And I'm trying for 30 years. And for 30 years, I'm no closer to the end than I was at the beginning. I'm still finding the same problems, the same challenges. And I'm in my kitchen and I'm saying, oh God, when will I ever be what I want to be? When will I ever change? Why can't I make, make a change? Because I was a Christian, but I was like a defeated Christian. Or I was being defeated frequently. And I felt that perfection means you stop being defeated. And I know God spoke to me, but I didn't hear a voice. But I, I, I felt thoughts. And it's like he said, you have it wrong. You don't need to change. 
You need a different existence. You need a different life. I tell you, just in the darkness, that thing hit me so hard because just at that time, my thoughts were thinking about the two Adams. But I'd never, I just had the idea in my mind, but I never understood what it really meant. And right at that moment, it struck me. One Adam, second Adam. I am in this life, struggling to be like this life. And that's not God's way. God's way is to transfer from this life to this life. Because this life has everything I've been searching for for 30 years. Everything I want is in this life. And I'm trying to create it over here in this life. I mean, you know, you know the phrase, it blew my mind. Suddenly I realized that everything I'm looking for and trying so hard to achieve already existed. And all I needed to do was to find a way to move from here to here. And of course, I grabbed the Bible and I started reading and everything began to open up to my mind. This phrase became valuable to me. In Christ. I realized that I was living in Adam when I needed to live in Christ. And it was possible. It's possible to transfer from this life and to be born into the next life. So, it made me realize my problem was not what I was doing. It was what I was. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. My problem was not my behavior. That was my problem. For, for 30 years, I'm trying to fix my behavior. But I have a greater problem. My problem is the state of my existence. I'm living in Adam. I'm living the existence of somebody. I'm, I'm living in a life that can't improve. What I need is to be born into the life that has already everything in it, the life of Christ. So I saw... That Christianity means moving from the old life to the new life. It's very simple once you can accept and understand it. So, I started to teach and to share it with my friends and to use a kind of gross terminology. I hope you forgive me. All hell broke loose. Okay, I hope, I hope that's not considered wrong terminology, but... I mean, it kind of expresses what happened. People began to turn against me, to write against me, to preach against me. And I wondered what happened because the thing was so beautiful to me. I thought it was like, it was like when I became a, a Christian and I wanted to hug everybody in church. And I was kind of surprised that people were not quite so enthusiastic about, about it. But I thought, man, I found gold. Everybody will be glad. And I started trying to share it with people. And my goodness... Everybody, so many people were, 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 were wanting to crucify, wanting to, 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 to warn people, to let people know how dangerous a thing it was, to listen to me. I mean, I appreciated some people like Ken, because when I shared it with Ken, Ken hit me hard and he said, he, he, he objected. Strongly. But anyway, he promised to listen. And he did. And what I like about um, people who have an open mind is that when they listen, they will usually acknowledge where they see truth. And it was that way with, with Ken, you know. And I respect people like that. But um, one of the, the, the issues that arose out of this was that a lot of people began telling me that the problem that human beings have is the things that they do. Because the only definition of sin is that sin is the transgression of the law. In other words, the only way you can understand sin is to understand that sin is what you do. The whole, the whole issue began to center around that question. Now, it was hard for me to be limited in that way because, you know, I had an experience, okay? I had an experience and I'm coming out of that system of belief. I'm coming out of it. I, I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I mean, my life changed instantly at that moment. My whole mind, my whole way of thinking changed. It was transformed. And I've been coming out of this into something else. So, when somebody is telling me that the only way you can understand sin is that sin is your behavior, I could never from that point on go back to that way of thinking. Now, ever since that time, 
It has become a conflict in the One True God movement ever since that time. And right now, the movement has, has congealed, if I can use that word, congealed into two factions. I don't like to hide things under the carpet or, or push things under the counter. I like to bring things out straight. From the beginning, beginning it happened. I was, I was separated from a ministry that I had worked together with for more than 10 years. Just over this issue, we could no longer work together. Something similar happened to brother, brothers Nada and Imad, separated from a ministry that they worked with over this same issue. And I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, we're idealists and we want to see unity. We all want to see unity. But I'm going to tell you straight, the movement presently, it has these elements raising it, their heads and all is not peace. Okay? Anyway, I, I probably won't say too much on that, but I just want to say that I want us to understand and that is why I want to just... just Touch on the subject a little bit, bit again and talk about understanding sin intelligently. Because if somebody asks me, how do you define sin? And, 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 the, and, and the person says, sin is transgression of the law. I could never object. You steal, that's a sin, right? You tell a lie, that's a sin. So, so how could I object if you say sin is transgression of the law? I have no objection to this. My objection arises when you tell me that this is the only way to understand sin. When you begin to put that upon me, you are trying to limit the way I can understand my problem. Because I don't care how you want to define sin. I don't care. What I want to know is how can I deal with the problem of sin? If the only definition of sin is your behavior, then the only solution is to change your behavior. Does that make sense? If you approach sin on the basis of behavior, then the solution to sin must be on the basis of behavior. That's simple, straight, common sense. So I can't stop with that definition, which is where some people would like us to stop. I have to go beyond that definition and look for a deeper understanding of the sin problem. And that's the real issue. That's the real issue. I'm not interested in a legal definition of sin. That doesn't help me. Okay? If I'm having an argument with people who say, Sunday is, is a Sabbath, then it helps me in that argument to say to them, look at the law and see what it says. If you break the Sabbath, it's a sin. It helps in that argument if I want to win a debate. But if I want to deal with the problem of sin in me and sin in you and how to overcome sin, that is not going to help me. Because that leads me to the place where I think that the solution is change my behavior. And that is, that is exactly where many of our people are. They, are. they are trying and they have been trying like I was for 30 odd years to improve by changing their behavior. They don't, they don't understand the nature of their problem. They keep on trying till they are 90 and one day, huh, they stop committing sin. You know why? They are bedridden and they can't move. <laughs> Finally, they overcome sin. <clears throat> yeah, I heard somebody use a phrase once that I thought was probably sanctification by senility. Because sometimes it really seems like that is, that, that is the end point of that approach to sin. You know? So, I want to look at five things that the Bible says about sin which demonstrate the New Testament, which demonstrate clearly that sin is far more than simply how a person behaves. I mean, we have, we have looked at this subject several times, so I'm not going to go back over the, the old road. I'm just going to look at five things which demonstrate sin cannot be simply an act of disobedience or of transgression. And the first place I want to go is that verse that we have on the screen. It's Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26. It says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You know, it's interesting that I, 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 I 
I don't think I ever heard anybody ever talk about this verse. Because in, in, the, in the understanding of sin that most people embrace, there's no place for this verse. It doesn't make sense. How many people here, don't put up your hands, but how many people here ever sinned willfully? And that means if you take the word willfully at face value, what it means is that you made a choice to do the thing. Your will was involved. How many people here ever sinned willfully since you became a Christian? And maybe I should ask it the other way. How many people here never sinned willfully after you became a Christian? Now, I, 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 I don't want you to answer, but I think I asked the question because I wanted to think. Because if you're an honest person, I don't think you will answer, I. Every single person that I know has sinned consciously and even where it involves his will since becoming a Christian. It doesn't happen frequently, but it has happened, right? The Christian, the true Christian does not willfully sin, but he, 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 all of us have knowingly sinned, and um, there have been occasions where we, we have even stepped across the line, knowing that the thing was wrong and choosing to do it. And um, if you take this verse and use the definition that sin is transgressing the law, then it means that most of us, if not all of us, are lost. Because it says there's no more sacrifice for sins. And all the people who, who define sin as a trans, uh, exclusively the transgression of the law, they will, they, they will, they will concede. Well, maybe, maybe they won't. But I mean, it's hard to believe that they won't concede that they have willfully committed an act of transgression. This verse is one verse that if you take that superficial definition of sin, there's no way to explain it unless you say, all of us are lost. But if the, there, there is clearly another meaning to the word sin here. If we sin, what is that? I'm going to look at that in a little bit later, but I just wanted to consider that, 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 that verse. Here's another one. 1 John 3 and verse 9. Whosoever, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And that's fine. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. He cannot sin. Because he's born of God. Now, again, if you believe that sin is a transgression of the law, what, 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 in what ways can we transgress the law? Well, I mean, the way many people define that, you can transgress the law by going to bed too late. You can transgress the law by overeating or eating the wrong kind of food. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I heard that it was said, it is a sin to forget. I tell you, there's no end or limit. When you begin to define sin by transgression, the Jews had 613 ways. But I'll tell you, I can behave probably in 10,000 ways. In 10,000 ways that are contrary to perfect morality, I can behave. As a matter of fact, I, I, I came to understand that even by harboring certain thoughts, I can actually transgress the law. So, the word says that whosoever is born of God not only does not commit sin, but he cannot commit sin. It's an impossibility. Again, based on that limited definition, we all would come to the conclusion, none of us is born again. Because all of us can commit sin. And I dare say, all of us have committed sin. We, may, we don't do it habitually, but we have done it, okay? Habitually is something else, but the Bible says you cannot commit sin. And sin, the transgression of the law, you're limited to the transgression of the law. It means an act of disobedience or an act, of, an act contrary to the strict rule of the law. That's the second one. Here is 
another one, and uh, we are more familiar with this, but I'm going to read it anyway. It's John 8, verse 34. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. Now here Jesus says two things about sin. He says, first of all, the first one I believe is transgression of the law. Whosoever commits an act of transgression, whosoever disobeys the law, is a servant of sin. He uses the word sin in two different ways. You commit a deed because you have a master. Is that what he's saying? I have a master and what is his name? Sin. So he compels me to do his work and what is his work? An action. So clearly in this verse, sin is not defined the same way. And these were, this, this is the master speaking. Okay? Whoever commits sin is a servant of sin. So in one of those statements and the second statement, sin is not being defined as transgression of the law. It's defined as the cause of the transgression. Whatever, the master who causes this is defined as sin. So you have two different definitions of sin by Jesus himself. Paul does the same thing in Romans 7, verses 19 and 20. He says, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Again, it's kind of similar to what Jesus said. What is it that lives inside of him? I mean, is it, an, is it acts of disobedience that live inside of him? Or what? Is he saying that I am doing the things that I don't want to do. Those are acts of sin. The things that I don't want to do and that I find myself doing, those are the acts of sin. But he says, the reason I'm doing it, it's not because I am doing it. It's not I doing it. It's some, something, someone, some element inside of me that is causing me to do it. Again, it's the same approach that Jesus is taking. There is a cause for my actions. And he refers to this cause as sin that dwells in me, just like Jesus does. So, in, in these three cases we have looked at already, sin is clearly not identified as a transgression of the law. When somebody tells me that the only understanding of sin is it's an act of transgression, they are clearly ignoring a great deal of the Bible. The fourth, the fourth thing I want to look at is Romans 5 and verse 12. One infects all. Look at what it says here, and there, there are several verses, but I'm going to start with this one. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, I always ask this question because it, 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 it helps us to focus on how to understand the verse. It says, all have sinned, and because all have sinned, what, has, what happens to all? All die. Death passed upon all men after one man, well, one man, one man caused sin to enter the world. And then when sin entered the world, death was riding on its, its shoulders. And so the death that came into the world passed upon all men because all men sinned. Now you ask the question, Suppose there is somebody who never transgressed the law. Would he die? Yes, he would die. And yet the Bible here is saying that death passed upon all because all sinned. It is suggesting that if somebody did not sin, he would not die. If the problem of sin was not with this person, with any person, then he would not die. Death passed upon all because all have sinned. The reason why all die is because all have sinned. And yet we know, as, as Brother Willie said, that if, you, if there's a person who never transgresses the law, he, he will still die because babies die. 
Babies die at the moment of birth. They die after one month, two months, after a year, and they have never transgressed the law, yet they die. You either accept Paul's theology or you think yourself smarter than him. Now, that is unintelligent. But all, all have sinned. And so you ask the question, what does he mean then when he says all have sinned? When he says all have sinned. What he's saying is that when Adam sinned, all sinned. In the sense in which Paul is understanding sin. In the way he is understanding sin, when one sinned, everybody, all human beings sinned. And I'm telling you, that's what helped me that morning when I was, was praying in my kitchen because I recognized, I mean, this is what I said. And, 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 and again, it was something for which I was criticized. This is what I, I, I came to me. David, it's not your fault. Which, 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 which was hard at first because I've been taught I'm accountable. It's my fault. I can't do better. I just need to try harder. And the thought came to me, it's not your fault. You inherited the problem. But the, the beautiful thing is that I inherited the problem. I also inherit the solution. Don't you see? It's a problem when I have a problem that I didn't bring upon myself if I don't have an answer. The question is not, a child is born with AIDS. You don't ask the question, who is to blame? <coughs> you ask the question, is there a cure? That's the question you ask. Because when you find out who is to blame, who, who does that help? Does it help the child? So, you find that we have a problem, you don't ask who is to blame. I mean, if you ask, you'll find out it was Adam. But then what do you do? You find out that God has provided a solution to the problem. And that's the real bottom line. And that's what Paul is saying, right? But again, I'm talking about understanding sin intelligently. And I'm saying that clearly, if a person who has basic comprehension ability reads this verse, he understands Paul is saying, when, when Adam sinned, all sinned. This is why all die. So the way Paul understands sin, he's saying it is something that can be inherited. If you go down to verse 18 and 19, verses 18 and 19 of the same chapter. Well, let me read, it, read verse 19. It makes it clear what he's saying. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And... Um, it just doesn't mean many as in a significant number. It means many as in all men. Let me see if I can find a, a, a version that brings it out clearly. Yeah, here is the New American Standard Bible. Because the word the is in the original and it's missing in the King James Version. See what it says? For as through the, the, one, man's, as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. It's not talking about many people. It's talking about the group of many. There are two groups. In one group is the one. And in the other group is the many, the rest. So it's all humanity. It's not just that by one man's disobedience, many, some people, a lot of people became sinners. It's not that, that's not what it is saying. By one man's disobedience, one versus the many. So, the one man disobeyed, and the many, the rest, all became sinners. And so, it's the same thing on the other side. The one man obeyed, and the many were made righteous. It's contrasting. What's the point? The point is really this. Is it possible for one person to affect legions? That's the point. How is it possible for one man's behavior to affect multitudes. That's the question Paul is trying to address. And, and then now, how does he reason it out? He says, look, you can prove that Adam is the one who brought the problem upon humanity. And once you understand this, it becomes easier to understand how one man can bring the solution. That's the point he's making. Because people might think, okay, Jesus lived a righteous life. But he lived a righteous life, life for himself. How does that become my benefit? And Paul is trying to show that even understanding how sin came about helps us because it was one man who infected the many 
and it is one man, the same process uh, by which we have the solution to the problem, one versus the many. So, this is the, the, the fourth place where you see that sin is not merely an act of transgression. It's, it's, it's a state of inheritance. It's something you inherited from our foreparent Adam. And even as we are discussing it, what, what, what I think, if you are, if you are able to, to follow what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, I know some of us are tired, sleepy, long journey, and our minds are a bit woozy. But if you are following what I'm saying, what you are seeing is that the, the problem of sin involves a state in which men live more than the behavior of men. That's where the problem really lies. Because it's important to understand this because we are looking for a solution. And, and if you don't understand the problem, it's like, you have, it's like you have cancer and the doctor gives you a headache pill. It's something like that, you know. It's kind of like that is how, how, how the sin problem is dealt with. <laughs> People are, are, are handing out band-aids, right? Things, things to soothe the symptoms of sin and they leave the root rotting on the inside. They're not helping anything. As a matter of fact, they are, they are, they are consigning people to, to destruction because when you give people a false hope, a false solution, how do you help them? You soothe them into, into a, a false sense of security and they are being destroyed while they don't even know. I mean, some are sensible enough or they feel enough like the, the rich young ruler. They say, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What do I lack yet? Some reach that blessed state. Like me in my kitchen, right? Some reach that blessed state and so they can hear, they, can, they are open to listen to something else. Others are so locked into their denominational way of thinking or their historic Adventist way of thinking that they, 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 they are, it's impossible for them to step outside of the box and they, 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 they embrace this way that never works and they hold on to it till they die. And that's a tragedy. And that is why I get, my face looks angry and I get so stern because I feel, I feel it because I suffered on that. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It's not 17 I want, it's 21. I have the wrong reference. All right, look at this. First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. I'll go back to the good old King James. I mean, I... I appreciate the American Standard Bible, but the King James is more familiar. Um, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Jesus was made to be sin. If sin is exclusively your behavior, how was Jesus made to be sin? Was Jesus made to murder people? Was he made to tell lies or to cheat or to commit fornication? How was he made to be sin if sin is exclusively an act of transgression? Or even if you say it's, your, it's, a, it's, it's mentally contemplating these things. Was Jesus made to be sin because he began to desire to, do, to transgress the law? Did he have intentions to break the law? Is that how he became sin? But when he was made to be sin, what happened to him? Well, in order to explain this, many of these brethren will say that what happened to him was that God took the guilt of these things and put upon his head. All right? So, Jesus was made to suffer for. John, how many sins do you think you ever committed in your life? I can't count that high. <laughs> Thank you. Me neither. Okay. I, I think if I stopped to enumerate it, would, it would number millions. Millions. Okay. And I'm one people, one, one person of 8 billion on the world today. Multiply that by 6,000 years. They say every single act of transgression was somehow picked up by God and piled up on the head of Jesus. How on earth that happened, I, I have no clue. Even when I believed 
in that paradigm. I was mystified. How do you take that, that, that guilt or, or whatever it is? How do you take that sin, that act of transgression that I did and put it on the head of somebody else? What does that mean? And this is necessary. It's necessary to think this way because of the limited definition of sin. But if, you, if we understand that sin in its essence is a state or a condition, suddenly the lights go on and it makes absolute sense. And I'm going to talk about what it is in just a moment, but I want to just read the other verse. 1 Peter 2 and verse 24. It says, it says basically the same thing. Um, Paul says he was made to be sin. Peter says he bear our sins. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye you, you, you were healed. But you say he bear our sins in his own body on the tree. What does that mean? Well, at least, even if you say it means guilt, you still have to redefine sin. You have to say that sin means guilt. It's not just transgression, it's guilt. So you, even, even on that superficial level, you still come up with more than the simple definition that it is transgression. Now, What then is sin? How do I understand sin? As I said, the popular understanding is that it's an act of transgression. I don't deny this because the Bible says it. And furthermore, it's the, it's the most common usage of the word in the Bible. And one reason for this is because the Old Testament, I'm going to talk about this more in subsequent meetings. But the Old Testament is, is a legal system. It's based upon law and behavior. The Old Testament is like that. I would never deny that. The Old Testament is based on do and you shall live. Disobey and you shall die. You have God's favor if you obey. You have God's disfavor if you disobey. The Old Testament is full of this. The principle that is emphasized in the Old Testament is far different from the New Testament principle. So, this kind of thinking, unfortunately, still predominates the thinking of many Christians. Many Christians have never understood the transition from the Old to the New. And they are still locked into Old Testament thinking. But I'm not denying that the idea of sin as behavior is even in the Old Testament. I'm not there. I'm not, I'm not trying to say this, but I'm trying to say that God is also leading us to a greater understanding of the problem of sin. There's a much greater understanding, and when you understand it, the entire New Testament just goes click, click, click. It makes sense. Everything makes sense. So, the second understanding of sin, I'm going to suggest to you, based on the verses that we read, is that sin is a state in which the person without Christ exists. It's a state or a condition. I'm going to demonstrate it, but I just want you to get that first of all. It's a state of existence. So, this is why I would say we are sinners because of the state that we are in. When I say we, I'm not talking about you guys here because you're all Christian. And Christians are not sinners. You are not sinners in the sense. You are not in that state anymore. Now, to get it clear, what is this state? What is the nature of this state? For, for, for anybody who will watch this video, and as, for all of us who are here, I want to make this, I want to clarify and make this plain. Because a lot of people are teaching, are saying that we teach that something passed on from Adam to his descendants down through the ages. And this thing is called a seed of sin. Maybe some would say, original sin, and, and they are distorted ideas. Many people believe that what we are saying is that because of the flesh we are born with, all right? We, we, we are sinners because of the flesh we are born with, because our flesh is fallen, our minds are weak, our natures are, uh, our, our natures are degraded, and this is what makes us sinners. 
and we are sinners by nature because of these natures. They think this is what we are saying because they have not stopped to listen. Did I ever say this? I probably said it the first year when I started to understand this. Okay, because my understanding was limited. I probably said it the first year. I've never said it since and I've taught it differently since because that is absolutely not what we believe. Human beings are made up of two parts. We have two natures. We have a physical nature and we have a spiritual nature. And happily, many of our people are ignorant of this fact. We have a physical nature and we have a spiritual nature. Now, the physical nature... Is, is imparted to us by genetics. You're born, and, and your, your father and your mother, their, their hereditary tendencies and weaknesses and, and deficiencies are passed on to you genetically. Every human being has that problem. This makes you a person under the curse of sin. It doesn't make you a sinner. It makes you a person with the weaknesses caused by sin. It does not make you a sinner. But what about spiritually? What is the spiritual condition of a person who is born into this world? Now, let me back off a little bit. Somebody remind me. Does anybody? What does the Bible say on the subject of good, being good? Who is good? Only God. What an extreme statement. And that is, so, that is so evidently incorrect. Because we know people that we say are good. And angels are good. And why does the Bible say, why does Jesus insist that only God is good? It is because he's speaking about the quality of being good inherently. In other words, why are we good? Why is Danny good? Why is David good? It's because the good one is living inside of them. All right? It's because the good one is inside of them. Take away the, 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 the spirit from, of, of God from David or from Denny, and you would not like what you see. You would not like what you see. The goodness we see in human beings is the consequence of the spirit of God. Wherever you find true goodness, you, you find hypocrisy all the time, everywhere. But I'm not talking about hypocrisy and pretentiousness. I'm talking about true selfless goodness. This comes only because the Spirit of God is living inside a person. Because God only is good. That is one of the, the most absolute truths in the universe. And it's something fundamental that we need to understand. So, what is the condition of a person when he's born into this world? What is the heritage Adam has left us? That heritage is we are born needing to be born again. We are born without the Spirit of God. If you are born without the Spirit of God, what is your default condition? Can you be good? Can you be a saint? Can you be righteous? This has nothing to do with genetics. It has nothing to do with your body. It has nothing to do with your genetic inheritance. It's your spiritual inheritance. What makes... Every person who is born a sinner, an unrighteous person, and in, a person incapable of righteousness, is the fact that he is born without the Spirit of God. In other words, the state of sin is not something that passed from Adam to us. It's something that is missing from us because of Adam. The state of sin is not something infused into us. It's something excluded from us. That is what makes a person born a sinner. That is what causes the acts of sin. When Paul says, it's no more I that, that do it. It's sin that liveth in me. He means the condition in which I exist without the Spirit of God. This is what causes the, the deeds of sin. And how does God propose to solve the problem? Simple. The carnal mind is... Room. Let, let's look at it. I don't want to just... I'd like us to look at it. Um... Romans 8. It says, verse 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Just like John says, He that is born of God does not commit sin. 
and he cannot sin. This one says, he cannot be subject to the law of God. So, so this verse is saying the, the opposite of what John says. John says, he cannot sin. And this one says, he cannot do righteousness. And what is the difference between these two people? One has a carnal mind and one is born again of God. So he says, so then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Impossible. But what does it mean to be in the flesh? See? But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. What is it that makes a great difference? It's the presence of the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God. That's what makes the difference between whether somebody is a sinner, a carnal person, or whether the person is a saint, somebody who is delivered from sin. Okay, so the state of sin is the state where the spirit of God is not dwelling in you. You are in a state of sin. That's what we inherited by default. The condition of every human being is to be born without the spirit of God. So we are born with a genetically degenerate physical body. And spiritually, we are born without the spirit of God. And that's our heritage from Adam. So let it be understood that when we say somebody is a sinner by nature, we're not talking about physical nature. We're talking about his spiritual nature. And the Bible teaches us plainly that the solution to the sin problem, what does Jesus say? John, 5, John 3 and verse 5, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's the solution. Look, at, look again at what he's, uh, Paul says in, in the, previous, well, uh, the previous chapter. That's in um, Romans 7. And look what he says. Verse 5. But when we were in the flesh, where does he put the, the condition of being in the flesh? In the past. When we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, what is he talking about the motions of sin? He's talking about the way sin kept popping up in his experience. The motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit for unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held. What he's saying is that the, carnal, the flesh or the carnal mind or the old man or the body of sin is dead. So now we serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So anyway, the point I'm making is, and what I want us to, to, to fully grasp is that the, the, the sin, this other definition of sin is clearly in the Bible, this other understanding of sin. And it is not the actions that we do, but the state in which we exist. Now, let's go back and look at those five, five things I mentioned at the beginning. I'm going to go quickly. I don't want to hold you too long, but let's go back and look at those five things. And let us see how we can fit and understand them now. For if we sin willfully, now he's not talking about actions of transgression. We saw that already. Because if that is true, we are lost. But think of sin here now as a state of separation from God. Now, does it make sense at the, now? For if we willfully separate from God, after we have received the knowledge of truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Does that make sense? Is there anybody among us who has willfully separated from God since we received Christ? Many of us have transgressed the law. But if any of us ever willfully, willingly separate from Christ, you have, you, there's no more salvation. I have stumbled and fallen many times. More times than I care to remember. As a Christian, it's not... You don't want to say this, but, 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 but it's true, right? But look here. I never let go of the Lord. I never ever turned my back on Him. I never ever said, I don't want you. He has always been with me, and He has been stretching His hand to help me if I stumbled and fell. The relationship between us was never broken since I gave myself to Him. And by his grace, 
It never will. This makes sense if you understand sin here to refer to that state of separation from God. In this context, it makes sense. But not if you take that limited first definition. 1 John 3, 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. This again makes sense if you think of sin as separation from God. The person who is born of God, does he separate himself from God? No. And can he do it? No, because if you ever do it, you never can come back. You know, there are people who, um, who backslide. And they leave religion, and they go out into the world, and they live like a dog for a while, and then they come back, and they are rebaptized, and they come back. And I know, even know some who do that like five times. And you look at a verse like this, you look at verses like this, and you think, well, they can't really mean what they are saying, because look, this person has repented five different times. It's just that people don't understand what it means to be born again. The person has passed in and out of religion five different times. The person has not been born again five different times. That is impossible. When a person is born again, they don't leave Christ and turn back to the world. Not so easily. If you choose to do it, it's like me, it's like Lucifer, looked into the face of God, knew all his goodness, and said, I don't want you. That's what it would be like. How many people here really understand and see the love of God and what he has done for you? How can you turn your back on that? You might stumble and slip and fall sometimes. You go back weeping. You are sorry you hurt him. You love him. You, you are happy to have him in your life. You're not going to turn your back on him and, and go out into the world and live like a dog. You're not going to do it. The seed remains in you and you cannot live that way because you are born of God. That's what he's saying. And it makes sense this way, but not when you think of it as just an act of transgression. That is, frankly speaking, brothers and sisters, that's an understanding of sin for children and Old Testament believers. John 8 and verse 34, where Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is a servant of sin. Here, here Jesus is really Referring to that condition and person, personif personifying it. He's saying the state of being separated from God becomes your master. It, it determines and dictates how you believe. Absolutely. You are separated from God. Can you do good? So it dictates it becomes your master. You commit sin because you are the servant of this condition <coughs> of separation from God. It's your master. It dominates and controls your life. That's all he's saying. Paul uses the same phrase and means the same thing. Romans 5, 12, 12, of course, becomes understandable. As by one man, the problem of sin entered into the world, and that problem is what? Separation from God. And I'm, I mean, I'm not speaking to people who are unfamiliar with what I'm saying. I know you guys understand this, okay? But sometimes it's helpful to re refresh our minds and maybe to look from another angle because it becomes even clearer. And in, with what is happening today in the world, and even in this movement, we need to have clear minds and clear understanding of what we believe. When Jesus was on the cross, how did he bear the sin of the world? Well, we haven't come to that one. I'll come to it in just a moment. But here it says that by one man's sin entered the world. What entered into the world was this condition of separation from God. Adam separated humanity from God, and this is what caused death to enter the human experience. Death passed upon all men because all men find themselves in this condition without the Spirit of God. Now, what is God's solution to this problem? The Bible uses a word, and I'm not going to preach on that this evening, but I like the word very much. In Romans same chapter, Romans 5 and verse 10. And look what it says. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Reconciliation is a solution to what problem? Separation. Okay? If, if the problem is not separation, why, why is the solution reconciliation? In Jesus, God reconciled the human race to himself. Okay, 
He broke down the barrier on his side and said, I have nothing against you. There are no reservations, no inhibitions. Your sins do not affect how I think about you. Man, I could start off another sermon right there. When I start talking about reconciliation, man, I get all excited. But, but see what he says in, 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 in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19. 18. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Look what it says. Reconcile us to himself how? Did he reconcile us to himself by your behavior? By your holiness? By the amount of times you pray? By how, many, by how well you have, you have overcome sin? Is this what reconciles you to God? independent of you. You know how I like to put it? I like to say we were, we were cut off from God and we were lost and God was, God was calling us to himself but we had barricades against the door. Okay? And we had all these ideas in our minds as to what we need to do to make things right before we dare to face him. And you know what he did? He sneaked into the back door and came to live with us. Totally, unexpectedly and contrary to all our defenses. He got to us in spite of ourselves and says, look, it, it has nothing to do with what you have done or are, 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 are doing or will do. I found a way to make you mine without you. I found a way to make you mine without you. Praise God. He eliminated me out of the process so it could work. And all I have to do is accept the process. It's the absolute truth. That's what the Bible is saying. He reconciled us to himself and has given us this ministry. And look what he says. To wit, or that is to say, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. That's one of the most amazing statements in the Bible. Because it has to do with the criminals and the murderers and the thieves and the liars and the rapists. God does not impute their trespasses unto them. Uh, astonishing. Amazing. And why? Because God has eliminated every reason we have for staying away. He's saying, your behavior is not the basis on which I'm going to accept you. Terrible as it may be, you can be Hitler. As terrible as it may be, I have eliminated that as a basis for acceptance. I have accepted you in my son. Everybody ought to say hallelujah for that. It's the truth. It's, it, it, it's astonishing and amazing. You know, you, know, you know, for saying these things, some people will crucify you, okay? Because it eliminates human effort and it lays the glory of man in the dust and it exalts God and his son alone. Some people will not like it. Because when you, when you, when you contribute to your salvation as you think, you can condemn those who never reach as high as you reach gives you a place for you to think you are better than other people. And that's why the, the gospel of self and works is dear to the carnal heart. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. And this now is easy to explain. He hath made him to be sin for us. He hath made him to be sin for us. So in the light of this, how was Jesus made to be sin? Simple, simple. His own words stated it. It killed him on the cross. My God my God, why have you forsaken me? That is how he was made to be sin. The fundamental principle of sin was laid upon the Son of God. God separated from him. And, I, and I'll tell you, even though we are born separated from God, it's not 100%. Not 100%. Drops of grace have reached the human race from the beginning because of Jesus. Because of the promise of Jesus. And because of what Jesus has done, the whole world is embraced in an atmosphere of grace. It touches everybody. But at the same time, Jesus on the cross took the fullness of what, that, of what sin means. None of us ever experienced it. We got some elements of it, but he took the fullness of it because he was taking my place. God separated from him 100% and it killed him because that is what happens when you are separated from God. That is why when Jesus decided to, be, to take our sin, to take our place, he had to die. It wasn't so much that it was legally required. It was that it is impossible to take sin upon yourself and not die. And it is what killed the Son of God. So it is clear what I'm saying. 
And I'm ending at this point. What I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is that when you approach the question of sin, biblically and intelligently, you will not be found insisting that there's only one way to understand sin. We have to take all the evidence into consideration and balance our understanding. When we approach the Bible with this understanding, I'll tell you something. You are going to see a world opening up before you before you like you have never seen before. The Bible becomes a different book. I, I, I will say this because that's what that's what happened to me. It has been 13 years, and in 13 years, I can't think of any phrase like my mind has been blown. <laughs> it blew my mind. I can't think of, of another verse because it's kind of like that. It's like kind of like your brain exploded. Yeah, and it's, 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 it's renewing, but it's, it's even more than renewing. It, it's taking you into places where you never knew your brain could go. You never knew your thinking could go. It expands and goes beyond what you could have imagined. And that is why, as you are my brothers and my friends, I, will, I want you to understand. And I want you to become a part of the effort to enlighten those who have chosen to stay in the box. Even within the, 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 the truth about God movement, some of us may be not so familiar with some things that are happening, but they, it's like roots are being put down right now and people are taking their positions and they are, they are taking a position. Sin is exclusively your behavior. They're actually making a movement out of it. So I'm telling you, I'm telling you from here, and I'm telling you that even though we love to have peace and not fracturing, sometimes you can't avoid the reality of what you see happening before your eyes. And when it happens, I would like all of us to understand what the issues are so that we can intelligently stand where God wants us to stand. So thank you all for listening, and I hope you have understood what I've been trying to say. God bless you. I appreciate and love you. And I am sure that we'll talk about this more fully as we continue through the, through the, the rest of the week.